Uh, so it gives us about five minutes to, uh, we may take ten uh, by executive order. So I'm going to open it to, uh, uh, to question and answers rather than to uh, begin with a question here. Yeah. Oh, hi, Joe Feeney. Uh, when I went down in 2000 to uh, LSU, I thought the place was this different, and when I left seven years later, it was that different. I feel more at home with the people in London or Paris or Dublin than the people in Abbey. The 150-year depression of the South since the Civil War, everybody would get up and go, got up and went. And who was left but the people that loved the place they were? And it was amazing for me to be excoriated by a grad student about being a northerner. I'm from Southern California here. But the world down there, I was thinking of you, Ron. Uh, you, they couldn't leave, but you could. Do you think that might be part of the reason why you, uh, your sister marginalized you? That's a question I, I get a lot. Did, did my sister, was she uh, maybe jealous of me that I could leave and she couldn't? Uh, I don't think it's true at all. In her particular case, I think that is what you say is true for a lot of people. She deeply, deeply loved this place, and she could not understand how anybody in her own family couldn't share that love. She thought it was a failure of love on, on my part. And for, for her, I think it was, it was more like imagining somebody leaving the family religion than, than leaving a place. Because, you know, it, where I'm from, ancestor worship is the real religion. You know, people may hate the church they're in, but they're not going to leave it because that was granddaddy's church. And we've always been Baptist or Methodist or Episcopalian or whatever. And Ricky kind of felt that way, and my dad feels that way, about family. You know, no matter what your family does to you, you stay because that's how you prove your moral worth. And, and I think that really Dante gave me a really interesting perspective on, on that. Ricky was, I believe, envious in this particular way. Uh, Dante in the medieval saw envy not as being jealous of what somebody else had, but of resenting that they had it. You know, and that, and I think she resented the fact that I did leave because it just, it was not, not that she wanted to leave, but that if I wanted, what I, if I desired what I should have desired, I would never have left. And uh, we never were able to resolve that. But, um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a shame because as I said, it's sort of foreclosed the possibility now that I have come back and was able to see in her life and death the real value of what's there, to see my place for the very first time. Um, the door in some ways has been closed, but not by the whole community. Other questions? Yes, Karen. Can I ask, you mentioned that young people get it when you had this conversation about place, and one of you at least mentioned that there's always this keeping all options open. Do young people have the disease of keeping all options open, or is that a disease of our generation. I think it's a, it's it's more than a disease of, of the of younger people. I think it's 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 a rational response, but uh, to a world of full of uncertainty. Uh, to uh, uh, yeah, I, I think most of them. I mean, you know, if you think of even a profession like the law, I mean, when 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 um, your generation, my generation. Uh, uh, coming up to, into our 20s. And the law was always seen as a pretty sure thing, particularly if you got into a major law school. And that's certainly no longer the case for uh, uh, people going to uh, sort of mid-level law schools. And even the top law schools, you know, the, the placement is, is more uh, iffy. And, uh, uh, that's, and that's just picking a very small group of people who want to sort of uh, try lots of different things before they settle on something, which I think is very healthy, by the way. I think it's, it, for a lot of young people, uh, going straight into some sort of professional track, going off to graduate school right away, I discourage that. Because I think it's better for them to work for a while and, and, and kind of just get to know the world. But, uh, mm -hmm. but I do think, uh, and I want to hear you on the divide, but I, I do think keeping, keeping your op options open is a, is a way of life uh, for them, and it reflects the, a realistic assessment of the, the fluidity of the world. You can have some thoughts about this too. 
Well, I, I, I agree with everything that Bill said. And, and I've said before that the hookup culture that's pervasive on college campuses is another manifestation of this. It's a rational response to living in a world where they don't know where they're going to be, where they don't know where other people are going to be, and where they're, the response is, well, I'm going to keep as many options, as, options open as possible because by foreclosing any particular option, I could get trapped or I could get left behind or I could get left out. Yeah, in some ways, there's a, there's a, you can also think about it as a response to uh, nothing, is, nothing seems solid. Very few places uh, outside the South, or as you described here, I mean, uh, Oklahoma is definitely not the South, and, uh, and if you go back there, it doesn't it doesn't seem to be the place you grew up. It doesn't seem to be. It seemed to change so quickly, and if you're 25 years old and you've already experienced that where you come from or the places you came from are not the same, and there's no sense that you know that uh, not only do their often parents will divorce and, and, and move to two different places, uh, their schools change, everything changes. You get a strong sense that, that, that unless you have a lot of options, uh, your, all your real options are taken away unless you keep them open. And I think that sense of placelessness in a broader sense is also a word. Someone had their hand up over here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there were a couple of um, mentions of it, but I'd like to ask about the dangers of too strictly holding on to an idea of, a, of too strictly defining place. And, I can think of uh, two examples come to my mind. One is uh, the city of Malibu. It's, the city of Malibu only exists as an incorporated city because they didn't want to build a sewer system. And because with a sewer system would have come development and now you can't develop here. And I think it's kind of border, borderline ludicrous that given the demographics of Malibu, they want to maintain an undeveloped community. And the other example I can think of is uh, I spent last summer working in Romania. And the town I was on, uh, is, on is a port town on the Danube River. And along the river there are all these uh, boats permanently parked that, serves, uh, that serve as restaurants. And they have bridges that go from the, from the, from the bank of the river onto the boat. And while I was there, this happened to be a time of flood, and a lot of the bridges were, most all of them were not operative because the bridges were underwater. And there were maybe two or three out of 20 or 30 that actually had built a bridge high enough to where you could still access this. And this was something that they knew about and because it happens periodically. And there were, I saw a lot of other examples of things like this in Romania too. And when I asked one of them, when I asked a Romanian about this, why didn't they all just build the bridge higher when you know this is going to be coming, the response I would always get would be some form of, oh, that's just how we do things here in Romania. And this is how we do things in this place, even though they know it's going to be a problem. So isn't there really some danger of maybe stagnation or even depreciation if you're clinging too strongly onto this idea? And I think that's an example of what I would call tra tra extreme traditionalism, which is different from, uh, I mean, a living tradition is one that adapts. This is, seems to be a kind of hidebound, uh, uh, you know, this is the way our fathers did it, so this is the way we're going to do it. Uh, I don't, I don't know whether, uh, I mean, one of the things that I, in the book, I, I try to emphasize is that for a place to be a place, it has to be dynamic. It has to have, it has to have things for young people to do, to come back to. And Brad emphasized some of this too. There has to be work. There has to be uh, a sense of development. I mean, it, of, 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 of more things to be accomplished, of, uh, of progress, of the possibility of progress. So I, I, I would, I think that's an unhealthy sense of place that you're describing, and, and, and therefore perilous, I would agree. But I'm, I'm not sure that a sense of place requires that. Well, Bill, you know, you, one thing I really liked about your essay in the book was talking about the world, need, we need to address the world as it is. And that immediately brought to mind Walmart, which is everybody's got an opinion about Walmart. <laughs> but Walmart in the 90s, thought about coming to our town. There was a huge fight over it, and they didn't come. 
the, I found myself on the, even though I was living away, I found myself on the other side from my father. My father wanted Walmart there. He's a working class guy. He said, we need this place here. The elites in town, the historical society, they didn't want it there because big box stores and all that. I sympathize with the elites given my ideological um, uh, views. But now that I live there and I see what a hardship it is on all the working people to have to drive 20 miles to the next town to buy <coughs> to buy dry goods, you know, because there's no place in town, in our town, to buy it. I see what my dad was talking about, and the elites there who wanted to preserve the tradition and keep the town looking like it was, something I, I, I favor in theory, they weren't looking at what it's like for working people. And I think that yeah. was, if I had been living there at the time, I probably would have been on the other side. If I could say just one thing in addition, uh, just a, a word, a good word for the concept that uh, really you find in anthropology, but not much of any, anywhere else, and that is the idea of local knowledge. That there are ways in which people, um, often in ways that combine science or some kind of quasi-science with old wives' tales and mythology and, and uh, sort of uh, 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 legendary wisdom, uh, uh, the way these things come together to sort of uh, structure the way people think about how to, to deal with both the natural and built environment around them. And I think it, there's a way in which the cosmopolitan worldview militates against that. Now, how that works out in the case of Walmart is <laughs> maybe paradoxical, but um, you don't want to assume that you know if sitting in your you know, Upper East, Upper East Side uh, uh, condo what's best for the people of St. Francisville uh, because you know something about the economics of big box stores. I don't mean you, you know. Well, I, one doesn't. I just want to say really quickly, last night I had dinner with Mike Sugimoto who teaches here at Pepperdine, and we, he's a, he teaches Japanese culture and history, and he was telling me that in Fukushima, in Japan, where they had the, the tsunami, he said they had stone markers there that had been there since time immemorial saying, do not build beyond this. Well, in modern times, they completely ignored it. These are precisely the places that were wiped out by the tsunami. Yeah. But because modern people thought they knew better. Mm -hmm. Katrina. Mm -hmm. yeah. You had a question? Oh, yeah. I was just I'm Tony Trammell. I'm a fan of Rod's too, and I've read the book and it's very moving, very good. And my husband and I talk a lot about plays. He's from the South, so we have a lot of good conversations about that. But I'm a Southern California native, uh, about third generation now, and I grew up in Orange County when it was Orange County, the orange groves and trees and strawberry fields. And I think the sense of my place um, was the neighborhood and that the kids got out and they actually, this is my dad, you either going to do yard work, you're going to help your mom clean, or you're out <laughs> in the neighborhood. And if my dad whistled for me to come in and I wasn't in by dust, you know, that was it. But I got to know the yard. I felt the dirt. I knew the neighbors. I could stop and a mom would feed me. If she swatted me on the rear, it was okay. We had morals. We knew each other. We got each other's back. And it's sad to me that the kids today don't have that. And I think that as adults, we have to be responsible and take that to our new place. You know, you can't just talk about it. You have to do it. You have to wave to your neighbors. You have to say hi. We live in a, a gate-guarded community. We have our own private gate. And what we find now is that nobody knows each other. The kids have play dates. You know, they don't go to the same schools. The parents are all at work, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying that we're losing it, that as people and adults, we have to be responsible, too. And I think that the whole play date thing uh, is indicative of something. I mean, even where you have... <coughs> Communities where of parents who cooperate together in, in the sort of mutual uh, upbringing of their children. There's something uh, instrumental in all of those things, it, it, and um, the I think one of the essential parts of community is is when you have share a life with people for non-instrumental uh, reasons, mm -hmm. just because you are neighbors, just right. because you are have a common life. Right. Uh, and whether you have children or not, whether your children are the same age, so right. on and so forth. Right. Oh, and they, they uh, paid paradise. I'll quote Joni Mitchell from my mm -hmm. family. They paid paradise to put up a parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what my, well, we, my home is now. We are constrained by limits of time as well. And I, and I want to uh, uh, make a transition as we take our break in a, in a minute 
to the, to the next panel and think about, uh, there's, a, there's a language about choice that's been brought up several times. And there's this tension between uh, a place that's rooted, so there's a sense in which you're not making much in the way of choice, and there's a, and there's a sense of place that you've chosen to make. And there's a tension between those two, and, 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 and there's a question about how do you, how do you make places? We're going to focus on the choice side of it, which I think the next panel will do. And if, if you're going to try to make places that are attractive, that, that reach affection, that, 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 what does that look like? And, and, and one of the, the themes that's also come through is that, is that any idealized place is, in fact, an enemy of place. That, that somehow you have to uh, approach the question of, of healthy places as understanding that they are, they have all kinds of downsides. And there's, and the, the, the best places we can imagine are going to come that way. You could, you could be living in, in Claremont and have a neighbor with chickens, for instance. And this would be very distressing. 